Bonjour Burundi, good day everyone. So welcome to the course representations of Lie algebras. So greetings from a sunny Brazil. So actually it's pretty cold uh, now because we have a winter season. But anyhow, greetings from Brazil. So why representations of Lie algebras? What is so significant about this field? Well, first of all, representations of Lie algebras are extremely relevant to many applications. Uh, first of all, quantum field theory, that's the main source of uh, modern applications of, of this area, uh, which is an extremely active area of research. And, and why? Because uh, representations of Lie algebras, that's the way to describe the symmetries of physical systems. Uh, then next is a theory of integrable systems, uh, geometry, topology, combinatorics, differential equations, and uh, so just a few to name. So essentially in all areas of modern mathematics and uh, physics, representation theory of Lie algebras play uh, a quite important role. So my goal in this course is uh, just to give you an introduction into this beautiful area and just to help you to feel the flavor of, uh, of this theory, right? And uh, so welcome and let's start. So I will open the file now and we go on. Okay, so I hope uh, the file is visible now. So the outline of the course, it, it's essentially consists, uh, the course essentially consists of two parts, representations of finite dimensional algebras, Lie algebras, and representations of infinite dimensional Lie algebras. All right, so we will start with uh, well, the basic definitions and examples uh, naturally and we'll focus on highest weight theory for finite dimensional uh, simple Lie algebras. And then we proceed to infinite dimensional Lie algebras where we will discuss uh, some classical examples of Witt algebra, uh, affine Kasmudi algebras, Heisenberg algebras, and uh, uh, algebras of uh, differential operators, or Lie algebras of differential operators on uh, algebraic varieties right we'll see how much we can cover anyway i prepared these slides so that they will be available for you uh, and regarding the exercises uh, so i will give exercises along the way and we will discuss them uh, during the exercise sessions right whatever whenever i say proof or check or exercise, that means uh, you need to do that. Okay, so let's start with the representations of finite dimensional Lie algebras. So I hope in the previous week, uh, uh, you already uh, saw a definition of a Lie algebra. So I just quickly recall uh, that uh, over a given field, a Lie algebra G, so it's a K vector space, right, uh, equipped with a bilinear map, which is called a Lie bracket, and that we usually denote this way. So it's a bilinear map, it associates with every pair of elements of G, uh, a third element of G, satisfying the following two axioms. First axiom is the axiom of anti-commutativity, which says that the square of every element is zero, and the second one is called the Jacobi identity, which uh, sort of replaces the associativity axiom. Uh, and it can be written this way. Okay, so I hope you already saw this definition, so I will not uh, discuss it in more details. The basic example of Lie algebra is uh, the following. So given an associative algebra, Right, associative algebra, it's a vector space 
with some associative uh, bilinear uh, product. So having this associative product, we can uh, make uh, our algebra into a Lie algebra, defining the Lie bracket this way. Right, so between A, B and B, A here, I have uh, our associative operation on A. Right, so, so here I am, we're getting a Lie algebra structure from the associative structure. So, which means that every associative algebra produces a Lie algebra. In particular, if we take all n by n matrices yeah, with coefficients from the field K, now this is naturally an associative algebra with respect to usual the usual multiplication of matrices, then if we use this procedure and produce a Lie algebra, so we, we put a minus sign on the top of associative algebra to indicate that now we consider this not as an associative algebra, but as a Lie algebra with such a product. Then we will get to what is called a general linear Lie algebra and it has usual notation for that. So it's the same, space of matrices n by n but now the operation of, of the product is not the usual product of matrices but this Lie bracket defined like that right and then the space of matrices becomes a general linear Lie algebra glm well it has a, a nice uh, Lie subalgebra right which means uh, a subspace of matrices closed with respect to this Lie bracket uh, that we define here. And it consists of uh, those n by n matrices that have trace zero. So trace of a matrix is a sum of diagonal elements. So if it's a zero, we will get, you can check that uh, the space is closed under the Lie bracket. And this is called special linear Lie algebra. So if instead of matrices, we use uh, linear operators on some vector space, which can be uh, finite dimensional or infinite dimensional, right? it doesn't matter. Just look at the space of all linear operators on this vector space V, right? We called it end V. Then with the minus sign, so, so this is a naturally uh, an associative algebra with respect to the composition of linear operators. With the minus sign, this will be a Lie algebra, which has this notation GLV, right? So it's a general linear Lie algebra of the vector space V. Next is the universal enveloping algebra. So I'm still recalling what I hope you heard in the previous week. So with every really Lie algebra G, there is a special associative algebra associated, which is called uh, universal enveloping algebra, and usually denoted as a UG. And the construction of this algebra is the following. So first, starting with G, we build a, what is called a tensor algebra. So it's a huge associative algebra, which looks like that. So it's a field K plus Lie algebra G as a vector space, right? Plus tensor product G, tensor G, then plus tensor product three times of G, then four times, and so on. So it's a huge infinite sum, right? So this is not just a vector space, but it also an algebra with respect to the tensor product operation. Right? And it's called tensor algebra. And then from this uh, big associative algebra, we obtain the algebra UG by taking a quotient by the ideal generated by these elements. So this is an associative algebra and we'll look at a two-sided ideal uh, generated by uh, such elements. So X tensor Y minus Y tensor X minus the Lie bracket of XY. So when we take a quotient, it means that in the quotient, this element or the image of this element is zero. For all possible elements X and Y in G, right? So the, this quotient is again an associative algebra and that's our universal enveloping algebra. Why it's uh, significant 
Well, mainly because it uh, of the Poincaré Birgov theorem, uh, which says the following that if we uh, fixed, uh, fix any basis of our Lie algebra G uh, in, in any order, E1, EM. So assuming that G is finite dimensional, the analogs of the theorem exist for infinite dimensional Lie algebras as well. But every finite dimensional algebra has satisfied the theorem. So if we have a basis like that, then we can describe a basis of the enveloping algebra, which will consist of the products of the powers of the basis elements of G, like that, right? When the powers uh, run all non-negative integer numbers. Yeah, it would be zero or positive, right? So, so when we say a product here, I still mean a tensor product because that was the operation in the tensor algebra and that's an operation in UG. But uh, from now on, we will omit uh, this tensor product sign and we'll just think of the product. And the Lie algebra G is embedded into UG. Now let's look at the example. SL2 Lie algebra consists of two by two matrices with entries from some field K and with trace zero, right? So they have this form. So a natural basis of this algebra looks like that. Right. There are three matrices that span uh, the SL2 and obviously they are linearly independent. So SL2 is a three-dimensional Lie algebra and the Lie bracket between these elements is the following. So how to compute the Lie bracket between E and F? Well, the way uh, GL and SL was defined, so that should be EF minus FE, where here is the usual product. And if you multiply matrix, this matrix times this matrix minus this matrix times this matrix, so you can see that this will be matrix H. And the product HE will give us 2E, the product H and F gives us minus 2F. So applying the poincare birgov theorem, we get a basis for the enveloping algebra of SL2. So it consists of such monomials, right? We fix uh, order for the basis of SL2 as F, H, and E, for example, right? You can choose any other order, H, F, E, or E, F, H, Right? But for example, if we choose FHE, then these monomials will form a basis for USL2. And again, by this monomial, we mean really this pro tensor product. And remember that to get to the, from tensor algebra to the enveloping algebra, we killed these elements. Well, kill the ideal, two-sided ideal generated by these elements, which means in the enveloping algebra, we have this equality, that Fe is the same as Ef plus the product Fe, and hence it equals Ef minus H. Again, what we mean is a tensor product, and also we're using slightly notation because we're using same letters for E, F, and H in U, uh, same as in, in algebra G. But in fact, we are now in the quotient, right? We're in this quotient. So G is really, uh, really belongs to, to the tensor algebra. Uh, but uh, going down to the enveloping algebra, when we mod out, we're supposed to talk about classes. Right, so correctly, I would need to put a bar on the top to indicate that I'm in the quotient now and I'm dealing with the class. Right? But again, uh, for simplicity, we will omit uh, these bars and just treat the classes as the elements.
a concept of a homomorphism between the Lie algebra, the Lie algebras is the following. So the homomorphism phi between two Lie algebras is a linear map that satisfies this condition. So it maps a Lie bracket of any two elements of the first Lie algebra into the Lie bracket of uh, their images. Right? Note that the first Lie bracket here on the left is a Lie bracket in G1, and the Lie bracket on the right is a Lie bracket in G2. In particular, if the second Lie algebra is GLV, right, the general linear algebra of the vector space V, then phi is called a representation of G1 by linear operators on V. So a representation of uh, Lie algebra G1 is any homomorphism from G1 to GLV. And it means that we force G1 uh, to act by linear operators on the vector space V by means of this uh, homomorphism phi. And if the space is finite dimensional, then we can fix a basis in V and uh, we can replace linear operator by its matrix with respect to this basis. And then we have a representation. So then instead of GLV, we can talk about GLN, right? So N by N matrices considered as a Lie algebra, as we discussed above. And then we get a representation of G1 by matrices, by N by N matrices, where N is a dimension of the vector space. And whenever we have a dimension, we have a module. And whenever we have a module, we have a representation. So there are two languages which are equivalent, a language of representations and a language of modules. So if phi is a representation, so meaning it's a homomorphism from Lie algebra G to GLV, right? then we say in this case that V, this vector space, is a G module. And G module means, when it's written like that, it means, so we have an action of G on the on, module is a vector space, which has an action of G. And this action corresponds to the homomorphism phi by this formula, right? So X, X on V as the image of X under phi, which is, will be an element here and here we have what? We have linear operators on V. So we can apply these linear operators, linear operator to an element. Right? So this establishes a correspondence between representations and modules. So we will all, all also freely move from one language to another. A couple examples. So let's look at, at the following representation of SLN. So here I have n by n matrices with trace zero. And here I have a GL of n-dimensional vector space Kn yeah, over field K. Then uh, a natural representation of SLN on Kn is called natural the natural representation, and it's defined this way. So remember that uh, X from SLN is a matrix. And then to act uh, on an element of Kn, which is just an n tuple of, uh, of some entries from uh, the field K. So we will just define uh, this section as a multiplication matrix by the column A1AN. And this naturally gives you uh, a vector again in Kn. And, and this defines a, a representation which is called the natural representation of SLN. A second natural representation, which is not, doesn't, is not called natural, but it's called a joint representation, is the following. So let's take... Uh, G as our V, because G itself is a vector space, right? So let's put G here and consider 
uh, the following representation of Lie algebra G. So now we will make G to act on itself by linear operators. So this representation phi uh, has a name AD and it's called a joint representation. So, so what is it? So it takes element in X and sends to an operator, linear operator, so it's a big X here, on G. And this big operator is defined in the following way. Apply to any element of G here, right? So element Y comes here. I need to tell you what is the image under X. So the image under X is a Lie bracket XY, right? For any Y, we define the linear operator like Z. And so this is called a joint representation. And a nuclear, so this is a linear map, first of all. So what is the uh, kernel of this map? So the kernel of this map is the center of G. So it's all those elements of G uh, that commute with respect to a Lie bracket with uh, any element of G. Okay. A G module P, There is a word missing here. Okay, a G module V is irreducible. So there is a word irreducible missing here. If there is no non-trivial submodules, P prime, non-trivial means uh, different from zero and V itself. Okay, so is irreducible if there is no. So there are two words missing, irreducible and if after this is. Okay, and a sub, what is a submodule? Submodule is a subspace which is invariant under the action of G, that it in submodule. Whenever we have a submodule, we can uh, construct a, a, a quotient or a factor module that we denote like that which consists of classes B plus B prime. B prime is this submodule that we are uh, modding out here. And the action of a Lie algebra is defined like, like that. Right? Whenever we have a submodule, we have a, a factor module. Yeah. Now, there is a correspondence between uh, modules over Lie algebra G and modules over enveloping algebra. So whenever we have a G module V, we can define the structure of a UG module on the same space V in the following way. So if U is a monomial, a product of X1 and Xn, which are elements of G, then we can define the action of U on any element V. It's just applying subsequently these elements of G yeah, from, from the product. So it's quite obvious so how to do it. Right? So whenever we have a, a representation of a Lie algebra G, we have a representation of the enveloping algebra UG and, and vice versa. Whenever we have a representation of UG, we have a representation of uh, G. Uh, in more sophisticated terms, that can be said in the following way, that the category of all modules over the Lie algebra is isomorphic to the category of all modules over the universal enveloping algebra. For us, it means that to study representations of a Lie algebra G is the same as to, to study the representations of the enveloping, universal enveloping algebra UG. Then the natural question could be, so why bother then with the representation theory of Lie algebras, if you can reduce everything to associative algebras? Well, the answer is that, of course, indeed, you, you are reducing to, to the case of associative algebras. But uh, you saw that when G is finite dimensional, 
UG can be, in general, is infinite dimensional, right? So it's a very complex algebraic structure. So, and to study representations of this thing is quite, quite complicated. So even though we can pass from Lee to associative, it still, it does not simplify the problem of studying the representations of the structure. Okay, but it certainly helps to have this uh, picture in mind uh, that there is a correspondence between uh, Lie algebra representations and associative algebra representations. It certainly helps. Okay, now we will discuss uh, finite dimensional representations of SL2 D algebra, which is the simplest uh, possible case. So suppose we have a finite dimensional uh, module V. So it's a finite dimensional vector space. And uh, I will assume uh, from now on that our field is algebraically closed of characteristic zero. And for simplicity, just think of complex numbers. So suppose that everything is complex now. And then, so this little h, which is the basis element of SL2, remember that SL2 has a basis EF and h. So h is one operator on this finite dimensional vector space. Since uh, then, uh, it has uh, eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda n. So suppose that this is the set of all possible distinct eigenvalues of h on v. And then v has this decomposition, this generalized eigenspace decomposition, where each, this V lambda, is the generalized eigenspace with uh, eigenvalue lambda. Right? So it's generalized because it, the elements of the space are not necessarily eigenvectors with eigenvalue lambda, but they are sort of generalized. So if uh, subtract lambda uh, from H, then this becomes uh, an operator, an important operator on this space will be lambda. And certainly, uh, this V upper lambda contains V lower lambda, which is a subspace of uh, real eigenvalues, right, with eigenvalue lambda. Okay, so in each V upper lambda, there is a V uh, lower lambda, which is a non zero space. Because in each one, we have at least one eigenvector. So let's uh, sum, sum up all of them and call it V prime. Then it becomes a submodule of V. The word submodule again means that it's a subspace invariant under the action of SL2. So meaning that if we apply E, F, and H of SL2, to any element of this sum, we will be inside of this sum. Okay, so that's check. But our module, assume that our module is irreducible. That's what uh, we want, right? So we assume that it's irreducible. It means there are no invariant subspaces, non-trivial. So it's either V prime is zero or V prime equals V. V prime cannot be zero because these subspaces are non-zeros. We have eigenvectors for each lambda, of the, one of, uh, for each of these uh, lambdas. And then we conclude that V equals V prime. Hence, our module looks, in fact, like that, with lower lambdas. OK, so now, let's, now we check that E what is the action of E on the subspace V lambda? Well, it maps it to V lambda plus two. So here's the computation. I did, but it would be nice if you do it by yourself and, and check also for F, that F does exactly the opposite. So we can picture our, this eigen subspaces in the following way. So we have, uh, there are finitely many of them Right? So there exists one lambda such that all others look like lambda minus 2, because you see it's lambda plus 2, lambda minus 2. So from lambda, we can move 
uh, to the left, lambda minus two, then lambda minus four, and it has to end somewhere because representation is finite dimensional, so it will stop. For some m, v lambda minus two m will be the last one. And then there is nothing to the left and nothing to the right. And uh, these in inclusions show that E uh, acts from left to right and F acts from right to left. Okay, so we can uh, picture the structure of SL2. It's a very rough structure still, like that. Now, suppose I take uh, in any of these eigen subspaces, I take uh, a vector V, which is an eigenvector of the operator Fe. How to read Fe? So you first go, you read it from left, right to left. First E, then F. And you see, this loop is an operator in this point. So if this is my mu, then this is an operator on V mu. Right? And since V mu is finite dimensional, there is an eigenvector. Okay, so I pick uh, one of them, and uh, again, since V is irreducible, then the whole module will be generated by this element V if I apply enveloping algebra of SL2. So I will apply this E's and F as many times as I want, and then uh, I will generate uh, the whole V this way. But if you apply F to S, E to S for any S to element V for any positive S, then this will be just a multiple of V. Which means if I go from, if this is my point and my V sits here, then I go E, 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 and then F, 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 I come back to the same point. What it says here that I will only get a multiple. Um, some scalar multiple, scalar times v. And for example, if uh, v has an eigenvalue, is an eigenvector of eigenvalue gamma, then for the square, here's a computation I did for the square, and it shows that I get a multiple of v. And similarly, you can do it for the cube, and in fact, you can work out by induction general formula. It means that for F, if I fix mu in that uh, space, subspace V mu, I have an invariant one dimensional subspace consisting of multiples of this V. Since module is irreducible, I cannot, uh, I suppose to produce the whole V, but I cannot in that subspace. So then this subspace has to be one dimensional for every mu. So in fact, in this picture that we have here, every point is one dimensional, right? And the number of points is, uh, I wrote it n plus one, uh, so, but it's m plus one, right? So this m is m, or n is m, right? So this n is m plus one. So here's m plus one. Okay, so I, I choose any V from V lambda and non-zero, naturally. So I take V, so this is one dimensional space. I pick uh, a basis element for V lambda, call it V. And then uh, for any K, I will define any non-negative integer K, I will define VK this way. So, oh, I mean, these are elements of our module, right? Because what I'm doing, I'm applying elements of a Lie algebra or the enveloping algebra equivalently to our element V of the module. So all the Ks belong to V. And we can check what is the action of H, F, and E on these V Ks. With H is zero, uh, it's easy because V K, it means I applied K times F to my V, then I know where I will end up. 
I apply one time, it will be lambda minus two, two times lambda minus four, three times lambda minus six, and so on, eigenvalue. So k times will give us eigenvalue lambda minus two k. And f, so it's very easy to see what it is, right? It's, it's this one, which I can rewrite like that, and it gives me k plus one, vk plus one. So this is easy. A little bit uh, more uh, elaborate is the action of E on VK, right? So, and here will be the formula and that's an exercise. Check that E acts like that. Okay. So we have an action. Now uh, I choose uh, a different, I choose a basis in every subspace in that picture above, and I have an explicit action of E, H, and F on, on this basis. Now, suppose Vn is the, in the last space, in lambda, again, it's M. I'm sorry, this M becomes N for some reason. So suppose this is the last one. So Vn is not zero, but the next one is already zero. So which means we reach the boundary. Now we are here in this point. And the next one is already, uh, doesn't exist, so it's zero. Right? So here's our picture. So then uh, since this element is zero, the action of E on this element is zero. Right? On the other hand, the formula this is a general formula for any k. So uh, I apply this formula and it will give us uh, again as mu is the same as lambda. So this if k is n plus one. So this becomes n and we'll get lambda minus n. So lambda is n. So this it's not mu, it's lambda. Right? So that's our first lambda from which we go. This lambda. So this lambda is n. That's the conclusion. Because lambda minus 2n, that was the last weight here. So we conclude that lambda is n, and what is the last one? It's uh, n minus 2n is minus n. So the picture is the last one is minus n, the last eigenvalue of h, and the first one is n. And our module looks like that. So it's an n plus 1 dimensional module uh, with basis elements, the i's that we define above. And here we have explicit, explicit action of the Lie algebra on this basis. Right? So then we prove that for, uh, well, actually, so here's exercise. So prove that the relations of SL2, those three uh, Lie brackets between EF, HE, and HF, check that they are satisfied. Uh, using these formulas and conclude that Vn is indeed a module for SL2. Then we show that for every n uh, there exists of, uh, greater or equal than zero, there exists an n plus one dimensional uh, module. And in fact, it's irreducible, right? It will be irreducible because we can move in this picture, we can start in any point and we can move around because there are no zeros. These arrows are non zeros, so you can move and you can generate the whole thing. And that's why you cannot have an invariant subspace. So, then for any n greater or equal than zero, then there exists a unique, up to an isomorphism, naturally, irreducible module of dimension L to n plus one.
Why unique? Because here it is. Given n, the n is a unique up to an isomorphism irreducible module of dimension n plus 1. Right, so here's our conclusion. So if someone asks you how many five-dimensional modules, uh, irreducible modules exist for SL2, the answer is just one up to an isomorphism, and this would be v4. So n plus 1 is 5, so it will be v4, and here is the construction. Okay. Uh, there exists an explicit realization of such modules. So we can realize the n uh, by um, polynomials in one variable x of degree up to n. Right? And on this space, this is n plus 1 dimensional space, and EF and uh, EHF act as these differential operators right, on the polynomials. And here's, for example, a basis for V2. For V2, that looks like um, uh, 2, 0, minus 2. These are eigenvalues of H. So the first one will be 1 here, x in the middle, x square here. And here, for example, the action of EFH on 1. And there is another one. Uh, there is another realization by homogeneous polynomials of degree n in two variables. Right, so it's n is a degree fixed, and h means homogeneous. So the basis for v2, for example, will consist of x square, xy, and y square. And in this case, e, e, f, h are these differential operators. And uh, so the same module v2 can be viewed as uh, this module. Okay, so you can play it with for, for any n, you can uh, write down the explicit formulas, explicit realization, or, or using the first one or the second one. Okay, now let's consider the general case. Again, I will see uh, the field can be algebraically closed of characteristic zero, but I will just as, uh, consider, uh, think of complex numbers. So if G is a finite dimensional algebra, then uh, we have a, a bilinear form, which is called the killing form on G, defined this way. A the trace of the product of uh, ADX, ADY. So AD comes from the adjoint representation. Right? So if we apply AD to X, we get a matrix. Since G is a finite dimensional, we we'll get a matrix. And same for ADY, so this is the product of two matrices, and here's the trace. So this gives us the value of the killing form. A semi-simple Lie algebra, so this is not a definition, but we can use this as a definition. Uh, that's a Lie algebra for which K, the killing form is non-degenerate. Right? So it's bilinear form is non-degenerate. Every semi-simple Lie algebra uh, splits into a direct sum of uh, simple ideals. Right? So they are uh, simple subalgebras, moreover ideals, which means uh, in the usual sense ideal. A Lie bracket of each GI with the whole G uh, belongs to GI. Right? And simple means that uh, there is no uh, any ideals. And the dimension is uh, more than one. In particular, SL2 is a simple Lie algebra. It does not contain any non-trivial ideals different from zero and the Lie algebra itself. Right? And dimension is greater than one. For semi-simple Lie algebras, we have uh, a very important theorem. It's due to Weil, which says the following, that uh, any finite dimensional module over semi-simple Lie algebra is completely reducible, which means that it can be written as a direct sum, it is isomorphic to a direct sum of irreducible G modules. 
So in general, this is not true. So if V is not finite dimensional, uh, V need not to be a Dirac sum of irreducible ones. Right? It can be more complicated. It will be a Dirac sum of indecomposable ones. Right? But it's, 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 the picture will be more complicated. But for finite dimensional one, it just splits into uh, irreducible modules. And based on the theorem, here is an exercise for you. So take for SL2, take V2, is this module, and take V1, which is this module. There are two irreducible modules. And we take a tensor product of these two modules. So this will be again a module over SL2, and here's the action. So since it's a module for SL2, then by the Weyl theorem, it can be written as direct uh, sum of irreducible modules for SL2. Find this decomposition. So you can think, so what is the dimension of this model? So it's a dimension of V2 times dimension of V1. Dimension of V2 is 1, 2, 3, and V1 is 2. 3 times 2 is 6. So this is a six-dimensional representation. And then, so right, right, think how it can be split into a direct sum of irreducible ones. And simple finite dimensional Lie algebras. So, just uh, recall the basic uh, things about them. So, suppose we have a simple finite dimensional Lie algebra. Again, I will think it's a complex Lie algebra. So first of all, the Cartan subalgebra of this Lie algebra is the maximal toral Lie subalgebra, meaning it consists of semi-simple elements with respect to a joint representation. So for SL2, again, if you take an element H and you compute ADH, then in the basis EFH, the matrix of ADH, will look like that. So H is a semi-simple element. And uh, in fact, this is a Cartan subalgebra. It has to be uh, maximal, right? So this is a, H is a semi-simple element. And in fact, you cannot add anything more to that. So that will be a Cartan example of a Cartan subalgebra. And existence of Cartan subalgebras is extremely important for the representation theory. So, uh, in any simple Lie algebra, we have a Cartan subalgebra. In fact, we can say, uh, in more general, a definition would be a uh, more standard definition would be that's a maximum nilpotence of Lie subalgebra, which coincides with its own normalizer. Right? But essentially, it is what I told you. Okay, may maybe I will just finish this slide and I will stop. Uh, so this is Cartan subalgebra with fix one. Then we look at the restriction of a joint representation onto the Cartan. Then G because it's a finite dimensional space, right? With respect to a joint representation, it will be a module for H. Then it will be a sum of the eigen subspaces. And uh, which would denote by G alpha, where alpha is not just a number because H is not one dimensional in general, like an SL2, but it could be several basis elements each of them is diagonalizable, but uh, that's an abelian because they consist of semi-simple elements, so they will be diagonalizable together simultaneously. And then it means that uh, we will get a linear functional on H uh, based on these eigenvalues. Right? So, so this G alpha consists of those elements of G for which the Lie bracket of H with X is alpha HX for any element of a Cartan subalgebra. One of the alphas will be zero, 
a trivial fun linear functional and it coincides with h itself right so g can be written uh, this way as h uh, plus the and these subspaces g alpha they're called root subspaces so since g is finite dimensional there will be only finitely many of them so this alpha will belong to some finite set which is called a root system the root system of g and so the root system of g is determined by g and h and the root system has the following feature so that we can say, choose a subset pi inside of this root system in such way that every root will be either a linear combination of the this alpha one alpha r with non-negative coefficients or a linear combination with non-positive coefficients non-negative with the node delta plus and non-positive with the node delta minus uh, right and and remember zero is separate now so there is no zero inside of delta so delta plus are called uh, positive roots with respect to the basis pi and delta minus and negative roots with respect to the basis pi and then if we take the corresponding uh, eigen subspaces uh, root subspaces g alpha corresponding to delta plus then we denote it n plus corresponding to delta minus we denote n minus then the Lie algebra G can be written as the direct sum of the following Lie algebras, N minus, Cartan, and N plus. And H and N plus usually is called a Borel subalgebra. And this decomposition is called Cartan decomposition of G. It induces a decomposition of the enveloping algebra UG to a such tensor product. And the final thing is this a classification of simple Lie algebras. So the isomorphism classes of simple Lie algebras correspond to Dinkin diagrams. And in its own term, Dinkin diagrams correspond to Cartan matrices. So I will not recall Dinkin diagrams. Perhaps you already seen it. Uh, but I will uh, recall the definition of a Cartan matrix. Okay, the Cartan matrix uh, is R by R matrix. R is a number of simple roots. And it's the same as the dimension of a Cartan subalgebra. And, uh, uh, and it's, so this matrix is a Cartan matrix if uh, the matrix is indecomposable. Uh, in general, th this uh, requirement is not here, but then the algebra uh, need not to be simple necessarily, right? So I will put it here. The diagonal elements are all equals two. Zeros are symmetric. And uh, the entries, all other entries uh, here is missing. Uh, they are integer non, uh, all of diagonal elements are integer uh, non-positive, right? So it's the Z uh, less or equal than zero. So there is less or equal than zero missing here. And there exists a diagonal matrix D such that DA D minus one is a symmetric and is symmetric. So it's transpose equals itself and it's positive definite. So positive definite matrix uh, for example, you can use a Sylvester criterion. It says that um, uh, all principal minors up to the determinant are all positive. As a consequence, the entries A, I, J are all from this set. Right? Not necessarily all possible combinations, right? but they cannot be outside of this set. And for example, in SL3, uh, the set of simple roots will be two roots. Let's call them alpha and beta. A Cartan matrix looks like that. The Dinkin diagram will look like that. Each node corresponds 
to a simple root. Delta plus will consist of such three roots, positive roots, and delta minus consists of their opposites. The basis of SL3 is given by this matrix units Eij, so I is different from J, and the following diagonal matrices. So H1 is this matrix and H2 is this matrix. And then the correspondence with the root decomposition is the following. The G alpha is will, will be spanned by E12 matrix units, minus alpha is to one. G beta is spanned by E23, minus beta 32. Alpha plus beta is spanned by E13, and minus alpha minus beta is 3, 1. And a Cartan subalgebra is two dimensional in this case. Right, and it's spanned by H1 and H2. And here we have uh, the generators. So above we had a basis, now we have a generators. E1, E2, F1, F2, H1, H2. And you can check that they satisfy all these relations. There are the short ones and the long ones. The longer ones are called serial relations. So these are defining relations for the Lie algebra. If we define it, uh, in particular for this SL3 Lie algebra, if we define it by generators and relations. And similar holds for any simple uh, finite dimensional Lie algebra. Okay, so I will stop here.